Welcome to the Real View podcast, where Ohio realtors connect you to innovators and influencers, keeping you with the real view of real estate. Whether you're a broker, agent, first time home buyer, industry leader, or just happen to stumble upon our podcast today, you can expect to hear tips, tools, tricks, interesting information, and so much more from the experts in Ohio's real estate game. Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of the Real View Podcast. I'm your host, Allison Wiley. With me today is my co-host, Carrie Arblaster. And joining us is our very special guest, the famous, well-loved Lee Brown, international motivational speaker, uh, one of the top selling realtors in the Charlotte, North Carolina real estate market, CEO of One Community Real Estate, and one of our favorite people to talk (laughs) to Ohio realtors, Lee, Carrie, welcome. To, thanks for being here with me today. Hey, good morning. It's good to well, at least hear you guys. And I can see you on video, but our listeners can't. So I know y'all are jealous now. <laughs> <laughs> it is wonderful to see you. We were just talking about before we hopped on that Allison was a COVID pandemic hire. So she has yet to meet um, it really a whole lot of people in the realtor world. But Lee, she still managed to figure out who you were. And she honestly was very excited to have you on today. So, okay, I'm going to start our podcast with our signature question. As you know, the name of the podcast is The Real View. And what we like to ask all of our guests is what is the best view that you have ever seen? So Lee, what's the best view that you've ever seen? The best view that I've ever seen is a view I can only now see in my mind's eye and in my memory because I grew up on a farm, which is now gone, except for we have one little piece of acreage left, but it's and now a housing development like everything else in the Charlotte area. And it's also Concord Mills Mall, which is sadly the number one tourist attraction in North Carolina, which outpaced the Blue Ridge Parkway, which is so sad to me. But anyway, the view that I remember in my mind's eye would be standing at my grandma's carport because we would go walking with her every day. We got dropped off at the school bus at her house and we would go walking. She walked a mile every day until she died and she died at 92. But as we walked out to the street, which our street was sprayed gravel. If you've never seen that, that's like the one step up from a straight gravel road. And my mother had taken Carolina blue spray paint when we won the basketball NCAA championship in 1982 and she had written Tar Heels 1982 champions in the road. That is the view that I remember when I think about my grandma's house, and I miss it so much. So that's my reminder to all of you young listeners who may basically be younger than me. You need to put those devices down and look up and around yourselves because you miss a lot of great views looking at screens, I'm just saying. So true. And I have to give a shot. I love that you shared that. So I was in between either UNC or Ohio State when I was trying to decide colleges. So UNC is very near and dear to my heart. I love the Tar Heels. I was almost a Tar Heel, but going two hours away from home versus eight hours away from home, um, I ended up at Ohio State. But I love the Tar Heels. They are probably my favorite basketball school other than Ohio State. But yes, I love that. You know, you have the marching band, though, that my son watches on YouTube all the time. He is obsessed with Ohio State's band, and I'm really hoping he doesn't want to go there because out-of-state tuition will kill a sister. So I'm not interested in out-of-state, but I'm <laughs> grateful for you two. <laughs> well, if he if he wants to be a Buckeye and join, it's called... I hope we're allowed to say this. The best DM band in the land is what it's called. (laughs) That's what it's called. That's what it's called. (laughs) We we would love to have him uh, be a Buckeye. But yes, I totally understand that tuition. It's not fun. (laughs) Well, the good part is he'd be adopted by every Ohio realtor on the planet as like extra moms and dads and grandmas and papas. So he'd be fine. But then Texas realtors told me the same thing for my daughter who's looking at Texas Tech. So Regardless of where your kids land, there'll be a realtor nearby to help them out. That's a good thing. <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> well, Lee, thank you again for being here. We're really excited to talk with you. We're going to get to National Ethics Day and all of the changes that we've seen over the last year. But first, we want to hear a little bit about you. I remember the first time that I met you or heard you speak was in Cincinnati at a major investor event. 
um, several years ago, and you were just phenomenal. You brought so much energy to the conversation. You connected all the dots about why investing in RPAC and being a participant in the association matters. But we want to hear a little bit from you. Allison kind of rattled off your successes. You're an author, you're a trainer, you're a speaker, you cook, you garden, you love to play music and to sing. Um, So how did you get started in real estate? And how did you uh, find yourself in a space where you've built this really amazing ecosystem for people who are interested um, in practicing real estate? I love that phrase, Carrie, and I might steal that you said I've built an ecosystem because that's kind of what it is. So thank you for that little hat tip there. I became a realtor 21 years ago because I was tired of the corporate life. And prior to real estate, I sold chainsaws for Husqvarna, which is the world's premium chainsaws, weed trimmers, and lawnmowers. And I was the only woman on the sales force. In fact, I even remember my Ohio reps. They were friends of mine. And that was a really interesting experience. I enjoyed it very much. Loved the people, but I did not like the corporate structure, which told me what to do and how to do it. Because as many realtors, I don't really do well being told exactly what to do and how to do it. I'm much better at being creative Although the corporate life does tend to instill in you a sense of discipline and the necessary tools to get things done. So I'm grateful for that background for that purpose. And then prior to selling chainsaws, I was a stockbroker in Manhattan. And if you're listening to me talk and wondering why you have an accent and I don't, you might know why Manhattan was not a good fit for me. Because every time I opened my mouth, people deducted 100 IQ points, which was annoying at best. But I'm not a city girl, as you now know from listening to my favorite view. And when I got into real estate, I was joining my dad, who's been a realtor since 1978, and he is now retired. So never fear, old guard friends. You could choose to retire if you so wanted to. And I joined him because I didn't know what else to do. I tried two different things. They didn't fit, didn't like them, wasn't feeling like I was in my space. And my dad said, just come on and do real estate. And I said, fine, which is frankly how most realtors wind up in it. You're like, well, Fine, I'll just try it and see what happens. And then here I am 21 years later. But what changed my business from production, so just selling houses, and not that it's unimportant to sell houses, but if you've been in the business long enough, you get a little bored working with buyers and sellers because you do develop the skills and you develop the reflexes and you develop the ability to respond You know what houses are worth and the thrill, as the Eagles once said once a long time ago, you know, the thrill gets gone. And there is a moment where you have to say, what am I going to do next? For me, that was learning how to give back. Because when you're in production and you're selling, 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 you wind up being a net taker from the profession. And again, not that it's bad, but you do. You're taking and you're going to have to hit a point where you decide to return back what you've been giving because it's it's such a big profession. We are true entrepreneurism because realtors can get in without a lot of formal education. They can get in without a lot of money and reach out to their networks, their neighborhoods, their communities, and build a thriving business no matter what the market's doing. Well, when you realize that's what the profession looks like, you start seeing your own obligation to give back. And in 2009, which was a great year to be in real estate, doing short sales every day, That was a really rough time, but I was doing great in my business because of my thirst for realtor education, always out there trying to find new ideas and new techniques. I had moved into short sales very heavily during the recession, and a realtor called me and said, hey, give me $99 for RPAC. And I said, why? And they said, cause you ought to, which is unfortunately how we tend to talk about the political advocacy work that realtors do. And after I made that investment, I got an email that said, congratulations, you've been appointed to the Government Affairs Committee. And I said, what is the Government Affairs Committee and what is happening here? I got voluntold. Well, I wandered down to the board where I had not darkened a door, not for a class, because I was doing CRS and I was doing Howard Brenton and Star Power. I was what I felt to be higher level education than what the association offered. I didn't do committees. I didn't do any of that. But the minute I walked in that room and was taken under the wing of an experienced volunteer, I couldn't unlearn the breadth of realtor life and then the depth of what we do in our communities. So at that point, my career started to shift from just taking in the form of sellers and buyers and commissions 
into giving in the way of volunteerism in our association life, but also at the same time, I had been asked to present on a stage and as an organic introvert, I'm an INTJ, which nobody believes me, but I can show you my Myers-Briggs results. I am a chameleon extrovert. What happened is I was asked to give back and share some of my best practices and I was panicked, not because I didn't want to share, but because the idea of a microphone just made my heart go into palpitations and sweat like I was having a hot flash, which now that I know what hot flashes are, they're actually worse than what I felt getting in front of a microphone. But these were those moments of, but I, but I owe it back. And so I went to the microphone and shared in that panel and said, oh, this is actually fantastic. And at that point, I started putting together presentations and I started speaking. So you fast forward now 11 years and I'm a volunteer junkie. I volunteer in all kinds of capacities because I freaking love realtors and what we do for our communities. And I speak all the time because I love giving people that aha moment of, oh, I don't have to do what everybody else does. Oh, I can do it this way. I can get better. And as long as I can turn on other people's light bulbs, whether it's through realtor education or through volunteerism, I'll keep doing it because now that's giving me the thrill that I used to get from buyers and sellers. And eventually that will fade too. So my current project, besides National Code of Ethics Day, which I'm enjoying so much, I have my speaker boot camps where I'm training other realtors to take the microphones and take the stages in an effort to replace myself there. So that's a long answer to your question, but I ramble. I love it. No, that's fantastic. There's a couple things in there that I, I really do just want to take one moment to revisit your time in Manhattan. Like that, I didn't know that about you. And we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but what led you there? So girl, my degree is in business administration and my focus was operations management. So if you look at my educational background, I should probably be working for Schneider Trucking, planning the logistics of long distance truckers because that was what I was working on was process mapping, which any of y'all that are super detail oriented now you're thinking, well, that's why I love you, sister. Yes, because you too plan everything out in an organized fashion. Well, that was my degree. I interviewed with a bunch of trucking companies and I just didn't feel it, right? So I was bartending because I had to pay my bills because I'm somebody who has worked like my whole life. I'm completely terrible at relaxing. I love to work and I love to get compensated and I go do And one of my regulars in the bar where I was a manager happened to be a stockbroker and she loved my energy. And so she said, you need to come work for me. And I said, all right, because I'll pretty much try anything one time. And I went and took the Series 7 and got into the training class. And then suddenly I was up in Manhattan working at Seaport Plaza, having cocktails at Windows on the World. That will show my age. But that's where we went to prospect. And then I was sharing a flat that was approximately this big, like the size of a quarter, or, and with four women in Murray Hill at 37th and Lex before that area of town got cleaned up. It was a little sketch at the time, but hell, we were only sleeping like an hour a night because the schedule up there is so fast paced. So I learned a lot, right? So it helped me manage my finances. And actually that background was one of the reasons that President Bill Brown selected me to help build the financial wellness program for the realtors when he was president in 2017. That was one of his initiatives. And it's one of the things that I love about what we offer at the association is a free tool to help members plan their own financial futures. And I got that assignment because of my background in stockbroker life. Nothing's wasted, right? No experience is ever wasted. And you certainly, certainly (laughs) show show that there's one more thing that I want to hear about from you because before we move into the National Ethics Day, so you touched a little bit on advocacy, you know, and your exposure to the government affairs work that happens and the work that realtors do, you know, to pay attention at the local, state and national level as to what's going on and how it's going to impact industry and the consumers. But it, it led you to actually run for Congress, right? Can you talk about that just for a little bit? Like, I think that's great. You know, you you have this experience, you learn these things, and then you're like, put it into practice, right? I did. And I'm the person that loves to tell people, if you are that passionate about something, put your money where your mouth is. And I feel that I've done that in my life. I, I first ran for North Carolina House in 2014 
And that was because my kids were throwing up on the way to school over those stupid standardized tests that were taken all the time. And I said, you know what? I'm going to fix it myself. And I did not win that race because, frankly, I did not know what I was doing and I ha did not have the proper team. You fast forward that to that's where I was starting to get involved in the political advocacy work as a volunteer. And I was getting deeper and deeper into realtor world because I'm a political junkie. I'm a wonk. I love reading white papers and policy information. I read the legislation when it comes out. And that's fun for me, I, which I know is odd. But I took all of my passions and my knowledge and turned it into fundraising for our organization because what we do is so amazing. And what I found is that more realtors get involved when they understand the big story. They need more than you ought to give or this is the insurance on your business or some of the shill that we put out there. Most of our members would love to be more engaged, but we have to tell the story better. And so I honed that. And then in 2019, it's actually while we were at President Circle, the announcement came that the results had been thrown out from the North Carolina 9th District and we were going to have an open candidacy, open race. And I said, well, isn't that interesting? But then my text started to blow up. You ought to run for this. You ought to run for this. You ought to do this. And like many other aspiring elected officials, well, if they believe in me, I should totally do it. So I went all in, put my business on hold in the hands of my agents. And it was only a 60-day special election. And I do believe that if I had had more time, I could have made it. But it was a very short runway for a political novice. I did not make it. But in fact, Several Ohio realtors drove down and helped door knock for me, Seth Task and Gloria Cannon. And there's there's this moment in realtor world where you see the impact of your volunteerism matched up with other people's passions and volunteerism and where we can support each other in really unexpected ways. So that run for Congress was a wonderful moment of learning. I, of course, lost and had... A lot of people that I love turn on me, but that's to be expected in the political arena. But the support was far outweigh the negativity that I got. And I just take that as a, a lot of learning experience. And the best thing that came from running for office in that time was not just the solidification of relationships with other realtors, but there are a lot of doors that are open to me. And I have a lot of private cell phone numbers in my phone and people that will take my call and what does that mean to realtors? Well, that means that right now, as we're recording this episode, the 1031 has never been that big a risk. And we need to keep that tax deferred exchange because that's how so many of our small mom and pop investors use a tax code to help them increase their rental holdings. They're not avoiding taxes. They're deferring it so that they can create more housing for more of their neighbors and I can make private phone calls and say, please consider this legislation differently, which is different than a mass email and it's different than calling staff. So those relationships I can bring to bear as long as I take care of them and nurture them just like I do with buyers and sellers and clients. That's great. Well, we are lucky to have you uh, not only advocating for Ohio Realtors, but also Realtors across the country. This episode of The Real View is brought to you by the Ohio Association of Community Colleges. Ohio's network of community colleges provides accessible training that accommodates the busy lifestyles of aspiring real estate professionals at half the price of a traditional university. With convenient locations in every part of the state, as well as online options, Ohio's community colleges are your smart choice for pre-licensing education. For more details or to start the journey to a real estate career, Visit the education page at ohiorealtors.org and then click on the pre-licensed course locations. There is one more thing I want to touch on before we talk about uh, the National Ethics Day, which is you launching your company um, in 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. What was that like? I'm sure it was crazy. As I was reading you know, your bio and preparing for today's episode, I was like, in a pandemic, you started a, a new company? Like, what the heck was that like? Tell us all about it. Well, actually, it was a month before the pandemic. So it's great timing because obviously you have so much time to get things done. But I had been with a national franchise brand for the first 20 years of my business. 
I should have gone independent far sooner, but most realtors will totally agree with me on this. We get a, a high level of inertia. You're like, I mean, this is fine because we have signs and we have ongoing business. And when you always have buyers and sellers, it's hard to think about transitioning because it's so time consuming. But the time had come and I opened this firm right at the beginning of February. And of course, we all get sent home on Friday the 13th in March. But what better time to be one community real estate? So I wanted to name the firm the way that I've conducted my business, which is not always about Lee Brown. It's about where I live and how I support my community. Well, what were we all asked to do when the stay at home order started? Support your local businesses. What do you do? Take care of your restaurants. Take care of this. Take care of that. So I was able to bring my team with me to all of us lean in. What can we do to help each other at this time? So we actually built our brand name in a at the perfect time. And this goes back to what you and I were mentioning a little bit earlier. What do you do with the experience that you have? Well, we've all had this experience of COVID, but if you're the one who laid on the couch and watched Tiger King and ate a bag of Doritos in your yoga pants, no judgment. That's pretty much everybody in the country. But what did you do after you finished the bag of Doritos and you got done staring at Carol Baskin? Did you get back up and go do something with it? And that's where we have to take these life-changing moments and these society freeze spots and say, well, what do I do? I I got to do something. I've got to move. And there's a forward motion that takes over. So for me, it couldn't have happened at a better time. Without the pandemic, I would have just been in my normal space, my normal speaking engagements, my normal buying and selling without being completely dialed in where I live. So I'm grateful every day that I jumped when I did. The only thing that makes my heart sad is that the brand I was with for 20 years couldn't have cared less that I left. They did not say good luck or kiss my tail or anything. It's like I never existed. So I'll take that as I have to be more present with the people around me, whether they're with me or not, and let them know that they're noticed and important because we are all playing in a really big sandbox, but we're all in that sandbox together. Well, thanks for sharing that. That's that's great insight. And I'm happy that the timing worked out. It always seems to to work out, you know, when you think that, um, you know, is this the right thing for me? Is this the right time? It always seems to happen in the in the right way. And I'm a big believer in, in divine timing and that everything happens for a reason. And I like what you said about, you know, yes, you know, you you're allowed to be in that space and have downtime and think, you know, eat a bag of Doritos and watch your Netflix. But then like, what are you going to do after that? And and I totally, um, you know, resonate with that. I was actually laid off from my previous job before I joined Ohio Realtors due to COVID. And I kind of had that moment too, where I was like, okay, you know, what am I going to do? I'm going to sit here and cry and be depressed and be sad. But then, you know, the day after I got the news, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to be on unemployment forever. Who knows if the payments are coming in, when their payments are coming in. Ohio's um, unemployment was a bit of a mess during COVID. But the next day after I got the news that they were, they were laying us off, I applied for Ohio Realtors. I had an interview the day the day after, and I was like, because I couldn't do it. You know, I, I allowed myself the day to be sad and depressed, and then I was like, nope, I got to take control. No one else is going to do this for me. Like, I got to get myself back out there and get it together because I do not want to be the type of person that just you know sits around and waits waits for things to fall out of the sky. So I love that you said that, and I definitely resonate with that quite a bit. So thanks so for this sharing is that. Their loss and the realtors win, and this will be hashtag be like Allison, <laughs> be like Allison and Lee. Yes, take control. <laughs> So there are still realtors right now that are, are floundering because the market is so out of control with supply and demand, and they're still dealing with fears from COVID. They're dealing with fears from vaccinations and fears from being at home, virtual schooling kids, and relationships are way out of whack because people spent so much time together that they had not been doing. And so there's a space where there is a, a fraying of the support and a fraying of the comfort and the confidence. And that's where you have to get up, take a shower, put on your work clothes, including high heels, right? So you cannot just put on your flip-flops every day. Put on the high heels, not the pantyhose. You're excused from that in the summer unless you're showing a house with fleas in it. And if you didn't know, that's why we wear <laughs> pantyhose because you can wipe the fleas off. But you got to think about how you look inside and say, okay, self, 
Nobody's going to do this for us. We have to do this for us, which is the same thing as your first day as a licensed realtor. Who am I going to call? Uh, the people that are saved in your phone. That's not rocket science, but it's hard to do because then you think, well, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. And you fall back into those traps over and over. But you can get out of a trap. You can get out of that moment with forward activity. And what I tell my team every day is that is your daily activities that determine your outcome, which is part of how the code of ethics can be a, a integral part of everybody's business, thinking about your daily activities and how that determines your outcome. It's not the once in a while following of the code of ethics. It's not the once in a while prospecting. Daily activities determine your outcome. And that's a perfect transition now into the National Ethics Day. So thank you for that. So you are spearheading the fourth annual nationwide fundraiser training event on the Code of Ethics. Talk to us a little bit about um, the National Ethics Day. This is the fourth annual day of that. How did that come about? And then what do you what do you think about it? Why is it important? And um, what are you looking forward to um, in hosting the day on the 17th? Well, frankly, it came about because one of my realtor friends, Eric Kistner in Tennessee, he's in the Tri-Cities area, which is Bristol. So those of y'all that are NASCAR fans, you know where Bristol is located. Eric is one of my coaching partners and really good friends. And he's also an idea generator. And Eric said, you totally need to go national with Code of Ethics Day. We should do more national classes. And I had done a national class for my former brand just to allow other firms, other agents, other brokers to stream in together. And so we said, well, that worked for sales tips. Why don't we do this bigger and go with the code of ethics? And I approached my uh, contacts at the National Association of Realtors. What do we need to do? Got the information. They didn't want the National Code of Ethics Day as a project. So I trademarked the name and trademarked the domain and everything else. So it all belongs to Lee Brown because you should always protect your intellectual property, friends. So this is all the Lee Brown Project, and we make this a huge fundraiser for the Realtor Relief Foundation. And to date, we've raised about $100,000 for Realtor Relief, which is fantastic because I don't get paid for teaching this class. The money that is paid by the associations, we, of course, pay for the broadcast and for all of the little pieces that have to happen. And then the rest of it goes back to Realtor Relief. And this year, we are growing our audience every single year. And the point of the large audience was not just to brag about having an audience, but this idea that as realtors, we are not portrayed very kindly in the mainstream media, including Hollywood. If you think about realtors, you either think about Phil Dunphy from Modern Family, and he's a total doofus, or you think about Annette Bening in American Beauty when she's wearing her slip and getting that house ready for the open house. And she says, I will sell this house today. And then she turns around and starts banging the king of real estate at that headboard bouncing against the wall. And you realize that's what people think of us. They think that we're vapid and they think that we dress up and drive around. They don't see the times that realtors hold somebody's hand. They don't see the amount of time that goes into counseling somebody on how to win multiple offers. They don't see the energy that goes into how do I get this house ready for the market? My mother just died and she was a hoarder. Realtors go through all of these things with patience and with calm and with humor and with intelligence. And they're so empathetic to the needs of their buyers and sellers on the whole. That's the story that needs to be told. And the coolest thing is we're all bound by the code of ethics. And it's a wonderful vehicle for telling that story if we'll do it right. So I said, why don't we all do this together? If we take our required training together online, we can get our hashtags trending. We can get our message out there because the more realtors do something simultaneously and then talk about it on these social platforms, we can really get our neighbors to say, oh, well, what are y'all doing over there? Oh, all these people are doing this. And then maybe we can change the conversation from realtors are vapid to realtors are ethical. And it's... It's exciting to me that realtors are willing to do this together because it demonstrates a better picture of the army of good that is really who realtors are. Yeah, so true. And I mean, there is a big difference between realtors and agents because of this code of ethics. And, and it's been a crazy year. There were some um, changes uh, to the code of ethics that happened recently. Talk to us a little bit about 
What is the difference between realtors and agents? Why is that code of ethics so important? What does it mean um, that realtors have to follow this code of ethics? And then maybe talk a little bit about the changes that that happened uh, recently to the code of ethics too. That's kind of a lot, but I will let you take it over. <laughs> let's see if I can remember everything you asked. So let's think first of all about the difference in realtors and real estate licensees. It's not that real estate licensees are unethical, right? They may be amazingly ethical, but they have not subscribed to the code of ethics. Now, in realtor world, that's one of those things that sets us apart. Your realtor status should be something that you proudly talk about, that you throw your shoulders back and you wear your pen and you say, yes, I am a realtor, instead of this typical trend of, I mean, you know, I'm a realtor, but people are half apologetic about it because you don't want to be portrayed as a used car salesman. Well, just as used car salesmen, there's some highly ethical, amazing people, and there's some that will cut corners. The same thing happens in real estate world. So as a realtor, what if you decided to go to a listing appointment and explain to that potential seller that as a realtor, you don't just subscribe to the code of ethics, but you're bound by it, that you've read it, that you've inherited it, and that you live it out in your day-to-day -day business. And you don't have to say a peep about your competitors because you don't know if they're other realtors or if they're licensees. Just talk about yourself. That's one of the key things that we know is that you should not be talking smack about other people in the business because that's a violation of the code of ethics. But if you just talk about yourself and say, this is why I believe in the code of ethics. And then I start off my listing presentation with standard of practice one, three, and this is one of the things that we go over in my class because I want every member to walk away with the ability to talk about the code of ethics to the public, not just to each other because we've done that for years and it hasn't moved the needle on the messaging. But if you go to the public and say standard of practice one three says realtors in attempting to secure a listing shall not deliberately mislead the owner as to market value. Hey, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, even if I wanted to overprice your house, I can't. The code of ethics precludes me from that. And I do not want to lose my realtor R or my license or have my children go hungry or not be able to ever buy a new pocketbook again because I led you down an incorrect pathway. So when we get to numbers, just understand that I can't deliberately mislead you. It's not an exact science and numbers are fluid and we're going to talk about a range, but ranges have reasonable parameters and I can't overprice your house. And realtors, when they get this information, they're like, oh my gosh, that was in the code of ethics the whole time. It has been, friend, but y'all treated it kind of like the terms of service on your iPhone and you just said agree. If we think about it instead as this living and breathing information set that makes us better if we choose to abide by it, there's such a tiny audience out there that, I know this sounds terrible, but we have a lot of members that don't read the code of ethics. They don't live by the code of ethics. Well, the code of ethics is also a self-policing thing. It is members saying we choose to be a better profession, which is what led us to the standard of practice 10-5 that changed that occurred last year with the board of directors vote. And the, the changes are twofold. One says that realtors, when we are protecting the public trust, and we think about this in terms of when you're working with buyers and sellers, they're in the public you have a license, you are being entrusted with their best case scenario, with their needs, you are their fiduciary, which is a phrase more realtors need to get comfortable with and able to explain to understand what a big deal that is. So the change that we made in the code of ethics took out that the public trust violations were only regarding monetary damages. We said we don't want any kind of damage of the public trust, period. The other change was, of course, the addition of standard of practice 10.5, which says realtors will not engage in hate speech against the protected classes. So there are actually four case studies that we're going to go over in the updated class here, because since that passed, we have had instances of realtors seeing behavior that they felt was a violation. So we're going to go through whether or not those were actually violations or not, but the protected classes are in the eyes of HUD, you've got fresh corn, familial status, race, ethnicity, color, sexual, uh, orient, not, well, no, sexual orientation is not in the HUD classes. Sex is, and so gender. And, and I mentioned this because in the Realtor Code of Ethics, we actually have more protected classes. We protect sexual orientation and gender identity, 
because we said HUD's got X, but we want to be X plus because we want to protect more of our neighbors. So there's actually two levels of protected classes. And the Code of Ethics says you won't slur and go after those different classes. And it's been very hotly debated in realtor world because there's concerns about the First Amendment. There's concerns about freedom of speech. But then it goes back to this conversation of, if you're saying really ugly things about somebody else, if that keeps them from their dream of home ownership, then do we want to behave that way? So there's got to be a, a an understanding that as realtors, whether you like it or not, you're a realtor 24 seven and you have a license 24 seven. And the way that you treat the public tells the public whether or not you are open to serving all of your neighbors and not just some of your neighbors. And that was the premise of 10.5. And it's going to take some time and some education and some massaging for all of us to understand it and get around it and figure out what we're dealing with here. And that's the beauty of Realtor World. We love these really robust conversations and we're not perfect and things have changed over time, which is why this edition was deemed to be necessary by the board of directors. So true. And you're right. It is something that realtors should be proud about and show off a little bit. I mean, this is what, you know, we are entrusted with every day is this high standard of practice. And we're, you know, committed to delivering that to our clients every single day. And it's something that should be out there more and that we should brag about more and be really proud of because it is a it is a big thing. And it is a big difference between your everyday listing agent. So thank you so much. We are so excited to have you. Um, on the 17th in just a few days for your class. We can't wait. Carrie and I were just chatting before this. We're like, can we sit in on this? We're going to have to email our, our staff liaison and, and see if we can sit in on this. <laughs> Look, I'm going to give you permission right now. And so <laughs> if you have to run that up the pole, then you tell old Scott Williams that Lee Brown already said that you would. And Scott will roll his eyes yes. and he will say yes. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Well, we are looking forward to it very much. And um, we look forward to any time we get the opportunity and privilege to speak to you. And it's been great. Thank you so much for your time here today. Can't wait to chat with you again in a few days. Realtors, make sure you get signed up for this program. If you're not already, it's going to be a great event as it always is with you, Lee. So thank you both, Carrie and Lee, for being with me today. And um, thank you to the listeners for listening. And we will talk to you guys soon. Thank you for listening to The Real View. That wraps up today's episode. You can keep up with the latest on the podcast at ohiorealtors.org slash The Real View and on Apple or Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Have questions, comments, or suggestions? We want to hear from you. Email us at podcast at ohiorealtors.org. We'll see you next time. This has been a Humble Pod production. Stay humble.